This is the Ladies Who Lead podcast. I'm your host, Luna Love. I'm blessed to be here chatting with some of the most amazing and inspiring female leaders we have today to share their stories with you all. I'm ever so passionate about the call humanity is receiving, especially us women, to step forward in our birthright as leaders. A new era in women's leadership is unfolding, where actions are heart-centered, where we encourage others to step into their greatness, and self-care is a priority. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be engaging in the lost art of storytelling, where vulnerability and celebration are abundant, and women who inspire you share their challenges, triumphs, tips, and tools for you to step into personal leadership in your life. Welcome. On this episode of Ladies Who Lead, we have Shauna McKenzie. Shauna is the founder of Best Kept Self, a platform dedicated solely to the self-care for the busy, the burnt out, and overwhelmed business owners who have consciously and unconsciously put themselves last on their priority list. She believes that when your business thrives, you thrive. And her mission is to help entrepreneurs regain the energy through their health, becoming more authentic in the way that they look, and living a more abundant life by creating mindfulness. She has a huge background in entrepreneurial career that is just outstanding in image consulting. She started the Studio for Image Professionals, a online certificate program that allows aspiring image consultants to um, really learn in a robust platform. And has just been nominated for so many awards in entrepreneurship and her expertise in communication and personal branding and entrepreneurship has been featured in many publications including the Huffington Post, Mint.com, CareerBuilder.com and other media outlets. She is a friend and mentor on some of my programs and I'm just so blessed to have her here with us today the editor-in-chief and founder of Best Kept Self, and to be a contributor on her platform has just been such an honor to get to know her and serve this beautiful creation that she has birthed and continues to grow and thrive through her empowering other women to share, including myself. So I'm so excited to have her here, and I hope that you all enjoy our chat together. Thank you. This episode of Ladies Who Lead is sponsored by the Art and Soul of Sacred Embodiment, a five-day women's retreat in Orcas Island, Washington, September 2nd through the 6th. Join this retreat over Labor Day weekend for a women's gathering where they will come together on sacred land to cultivate a deepened embodiment of the feminine. The Art and Soul of Sacred Embodiment is a five-day retreat held in the Salish Islands of the Pacific Northwest. The setting is beautiful in its juxtaposition of privacy, intimacy, spaciousness, surrounded by vast open skies and tall redwood cedars. We will gather in sisterhood to support each other in expanding more deeply into our fullest selves through vulnerability, sacred rituals, and grounded practices. Exploring this so we can share our greatest selves outwardly. This retreat is hosted and facilitated by myself, Luna Love, and my co-facilitator, Honeybee Henderson. We hope you'll join us. You can find more information at sacredembodimentretreat.com. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Ladies Who Lead. Today, I am blessed to announce that we have the very inspiring and motivated Shauna McKenzie, founder of Best Kept Self, minimalist, operations whiz, and coach to small business owners. This year, Shauna has launched her Reboot program, A Year in the Making, and it is a cutting-edge lifestyle design program for the overwhelmed business owners. You can find Shauna on Facebook and Instagram at Shauna McKenzie and always at bestkeptself.com. I am honored to welcome Shauna. Thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So as always, we begin with a blessing. So... Let's just take a moment to close our eyes if that feels good. 
And find your feet or your seat or the places where you're being held and supported and just kind of rest into those places and receive that support. And we ground together to come into one accord, trusting that everything and anything that comes up for each of us, for all of us during this time is in service to our growth. And we come into this one accord by taking one full, big, deep breath letting everything from the day go and arriving in this present moment. So inhaling, filling the lungs up completely and fully and letting it go with a nice sigh, acknowledging that I have arrived. And we ask that this energy of life, of love, fill us, clear us, surround us, and protect us in this journey. And you just can allow yourselves to be bathed in that light and in that love. And allow the eyes to open in their own timing, bringing us back to the shared and co-created space of connection and storytelling. Awesome. So, Shana, I'm so excited to have you here today with us. I've been working in so many different ways with you for a few years now. Uh, started writing as a contributor for Best Kept Self, and you've mentored on some of my programs, and it's just so lovely to have you here. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great to get to know you through the contributor program and to be able to engage and collaborate. That's exactly what I had hoped that program would turn into. So it's Beautiful to have relationships like this spring out of it. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to jump right in and give us a little, so you have a, a huge academic background and business background and you've started Best Kept Self. Can you share a little bit about your journey and what that has been like and really weaving into that the aspects of leadership that you've been called to step into along that journey? No, yeah, I don't know if I can summarize that succinctly, but I will try. Um, so I started my first consultancy in 2000. And um, when I started my consultancy in 2007, I had a very specific direct focus and I was in the image consulting industry and I really loved it for the first two years that I was in it. But um, due to even just social media changing and the internet changing and all of these things, my own interests within my business and how I was operating it were evolving, but I wasn't evolving along with it. And so I like to say that I entered year three with this year of um, almost like business contempt and putting a smile on my face because I had been doing things for the first two years and loving it. And then when my interests changed, I didn't change with it. And so I started to feel kind of contemptful about what I was doing um, in the industry that I was in. And I felt constantly like I was devaluing myself. And so I kind of spent a year, which I've realized now, how, um, and what the program that I built caters to is a lot of business owners kind of hit these teenage years of three to six to seven, and they start to see management issues and some of the same things that I saw. Um, so year three was kind of a, a, a dark place for me in my business, and that's where I really kind of faced a lot of change and transition. Um, I would say that that was the first time, besides starting my own business, that I took my leadership to a whole different level. You know, leadership just in terms of the people around me that were kind of watching me and engaging with my business, but also just the leadership within my own world and what I wanted for my life. Um, and so that that really entailed setting aside ego for probably truly the first time in my life, like completely setting aside pride and ego meant stripping things down to the foundation and facing some really hard truths. Um, but on the other side of that was a lot of success in a very different way. And so from there, my career evolved from taking the consulting work that I was doing and opening up a training studio for those looking to get into the image consulting business, which I still have today. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't kind of overcome a lot of those issues that I was facing around value and around self-worth and around 
just putting yourself first, which is now the mantra that I live by for best kept self. Um, so as my story unfolded and as I saw other entrepreneurs face the same story, that's where this idea of best kept self kind of came from. Um, and I was able to dissolve my original consultancy by passing it off to someone that loved it and loved the client work more than I did at the time and evolve it into this bigger thing that we now call best kept self. And so that's kind of where we are today. So it's kind of, I think, the general path that a lot of leaders follow when they have their own story, they live it, they breathe it, they overcome, and then they feel this calling and this desire to take that story and help others so that they can take the shortcut or they can overcome the challenges with a method or a system or with advice or with mentorship. And that's kind of where I view my place now in the world. Beautiful. I love that. And I love the intention of best kept self, the aspect of putting yourself first in order for your business to thrive rather than the way that we often see things in the world, which is work, 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 business first, put family, nourishment, self-care, all of that stuff second, and, and maybe the money piece is there, but, but we want this like well-rounded life. And so I just have really enjoyed um, what all the contributors and what the intention of Best Kept Self has really brought into my life and what I share with my clients as well, because I think it's just so important and a huge piece of feminine leadership, which is what we're talking about is really shifting the dynamic from that patriarchal and masculine view into this more self-nurturing and nurturing for others, uplifting energy. And I just feel like you've created such a beautiful platform for greater awareness and conversation around that. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. I mean, selfishly, you know, it was started out of my own desire for, for what I went through. And it's been really humbling and amazing for me to kind of sit back and let it take on a world of its own without me controlling it. And it's probably one of the first projects and businesses in my life where I, where I have been more of a, you know, I, I manage it, but I really like to stay open to what kind of unravels as we go along with this process. And to have conversations like this, especially when we talk about the way men and the way women do business and, um, the differences between those two things, it's really important to drive home this message of self-care. It's so incredibly important. And especially in entrepreneurship, because there's that hustle aspect, you know, that Gary Vaynerchuk and those that are like him just press out to the world. And if it's not taken with a grain of salt, and if it's not taken with consideration of how to prioritize your biggest assets, which are your mind, body, and soul, you can really burn out. And then you don't have a business to run because you're not running and you're not functioning. So um, it's, it's an honor for me to be a part of it because I feel like I'm very much so in the background of that business and I get to let all the contributors and everyone involved shine and do what they do best, which is spread this message. Beautiful. Uh, can you tell me about a time when you were personally challenged in stepping into your greatest self into your highest self the next version of yourself was presenting itself it was saying i'm here i'm ready to be embodied and that kind of resistance and fight was really present for you and kind of how you moved through that yeah so i'll go back to that year three you know when you go into anything especially starting a business um for me i spent a lot of time you know, creating the vision of what that would look like in the future and that was part of my success process. And it still is to this day, but in a different variation. Initially, when I created that vision, um, I, I stuck so tightly to it that even though things were evolving outside of me and, and my own interests were evolving, like I said before, because I had that vision that I was grasping so strongly, I didn't allow myself to be adaptable to my own business. So the thing that I used to love all of a sudden kind of became a ball and chain. And I felt like a prisoner in this own box of my business that I had created. And all of that was about thinking big. But the problem with thinking big is that it was hindering me at this time as well, because I wasn't letting my vision change along with me. And so when I hit year three, the hardest thing is when you don't want to be doing the things in the business anymore. 
And as obvious as that sounds, I think a lot of business owners find themselves in a position where, um, like I said, their talents or their skills or their interests change or collaborations come along and they realize that their interests do change, but they have this thing they put out to the world. How dare could they, you know, shut it down or pivot or dissolve it because we constantly feel this need to finish something or to follow through on that vision. And so those desires really caught me in a place that, like I said, put me in not only an emotional, but a financial, financial, a physical, regarding my health, like a really bad place in my life. And it wasn't until I stripped down, removed ego, really got at the core of the problems and decided that this was not worth forsaking my happiness, um, that I made a change and, made, and started making pivots that were necessary. Um, and that was a really, really hard time for me. And not only did I have my own pressure, but I had my, um, I don't know if he was a fiance at the time, but my boyfriend, now husband, who's also self-employed, basically acting as a mirror back to myself, telling me the same things and putting the pressure on me that I, I didn't want to face and say out loud to him. And now I have him telling it to me. And so, you know, anytime we have an outside dynamic telling us our biggest fears or the things that we already feel and have anxiety over, that just, you know, spirals things up even more. That, you know, that, like I said, was a major shift in my life. And it really, it really meant letting go of the vision that I had created to create a new one. And that's much easier said than done. Yeah, I think that's a really good lesson for so many is letting things evolve in their own time and pacing and we may have like a, a tunnel vision of like the end goal and when there isn't like this space of letting things evolve in their own we we can miss opportunities to create something even bigger or better and i think that that is so relevant in so many areas of our lives outside of just business or creating a project or birthing something, but in relationships and agreements and family dynamics or like anything. It's just like when we have this view of what it's supposed to be like, we miss out on what it could be. And I think a lot of that is like also deep listening um, rather than just your will, the will of the will of, you know, spirit and life moving in its own way. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Um, it's so hard to, it's so hard to follow through on what you're listening to. I think it's easy to listen. I think that, I think that more often the problem is not in the listening aspect. I think the problem is then following that direction. And uh, um, like I said, there's so many outside pressures, expectations, and our own buildups in our own head that keep us and prevent us from actually following through on, on what that voice, wherever it's coming from, is telling us. And it, it still remains to this day to be one of the most valuable tools in my business is my intuition and that voice. But listening to it's a different story sometimes. <laughs> yeah, awareness without action is kind of like futile. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so... I'd love to know where you have the most stubbornness in your life. Where does stubbornness come up the most for you? Oh my gosh, independence. It's so bad. Um, I've always been an independent kid growing up. Uh, my parents always, you know, my mom would always tell me, you would make an excellent military wife because you just don't need anyone around, you know? <laughs> so independence um, has always kind of been uh, very strong within me, but it gets me into a lot of trouble because I'm I'm so extreme with it. And most of the time it gets me into trouble with my personal relationships, obviously the one with my spouse. And just him and I working through that, because he's a very independent person as well, I've had to learn how to be vulnerable. And I think a lot of times um, when you see super independent people, I would venture to guess that the lack of vulnerability is probably a pattern that we would see. And so for me, um, I was so stubborn about showing any sort of vulnerability. I, for the longest time, only up until about three, maybe four years ago, I had never once cried in like in a movie if another person was around. Like if we went and saw The Notebook or Titanic, I never would allow myself to cry when someone else was around me. 
And now I would cry over other things, like if I had a breakup or whatever, but it was these weird situations where I could not show vulnerability for whatever reason. And I would put all this energy into constraining it and containing it within myself. And I think that that is 100% linked to this independence and what independent kind of meant in the story that I told. Um, so by far, the independence linked with the lack of vulnerability was my biggest stubborn point, which I feel... Um, honored to say that I've done a lot of work around, but it's taken several years to get a lot of that out of me. Yeah, and being careful not to confuse um, independence with like separation, like separating yes. yourself from your environment or your friends or your loved ones. And yeah, vulnerability is like the key to connection. So vulnerability brings people together. And so that's such an interesting interesting challenge to be met with and I just love the way you talk about it and I, f I can feel the attention and intention that has gone into creating shifts in that area so but yeah and it's, you. Scary. it's scary I think you know people who have fears around, around vulnerability it manifests in different ways but I think we can all share in the same same fear of what that feels like um, and for me it was it manifested weirdly I mean I could be incredibly vulnerable around my best girlfriends but when it came to um, maybe it's the men in my life but my spouse it was a totally different story and it was this very weird thing and I wasn't okay with that he wasn't okay with that but I mean I took my own initiative to dive deep because you know again, not to, not to like say that business is always my priority, but I've always known that the things in my personal life, those same issues show up in your business life as well. If you have an issue around receiving in your personal life, you're going to have an issue around receiving in your business life. If you're not vulnerable in your personal life, you're not going to be vulnerable in your business life and you need all of these things. So for me, anytime I see an issue either or in business or personal, I would definitely want to get to the heart of it because I know both of those things work together seamlessly. For sure. Beautiful. I think that's really valuable for, for all of our listeners. Can you share the voice of your inner mean girl? And what does she sound like? And then how do you respond when she comes forward? So when she presents herself, what are the ways that you meet her and kind of either move into that space or move out of that space? Yeah, so the inner mean girl, that is such an interesting question. I love that. I say that what has gone through my head sometimes when I'm critical of other people, which I guess is what I consider the mean girl, is um, it's like this thought of when I see someone who doesn't feel like they're at the place that they should be at or someone who's maybe, you know, saying that they're not as farther along as they should be. I have this criticism towards them that um, they're not working enough or and when I see people constantly asking for things or asking for help, I want to sometimes scream like, go figure it out. Just because, again, I told you I'm so incredibly independent that I just expect everyone to be on my level of going and figuring out. Now, the problem with that is I have a hard time asking for help. And so when I see other people doing it, as I'm well aware, that is a reflection. My anxiety over them being that way is because I was never able to reach out and ask people for help. And so anytime I have an inner mean girl moment and I see myself being critical that other people are just, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm calling them lazy per se, but in a sense, I suppose it's like, go do it. Just go figure it out. Um, that's a call to me that there's something that I'm not yet over something I have yet that's that's challenging me that I need to overcome and so I think it completely relates back to that whole in, uh, independence thing and not being able to ask for help and being vulnerable it very well could be yeah mm -hmm. um I often look at this question as like the self-saboteur like the one who's kind of like the voice of like I can't or like not good enough around ourselves and I've actually found that the way that you answered is really common that um, sometimes we have it outward and sometimes people have it more inward. Whereas like judgment goes towards the self more than the other. But I think that with the way that you wrapped it up is so beautiful because 
you have that dual. It's like you ha- you're so aware that like anything that you're projecting outward is like a place for you to look at inside yourself. And so that awareness is huge in being able to, to deepen, to become more vulnerable, to overcome that. And yeah, and so I think that the way that you kind of move through the inner mean girl is by taking a self-reflection. That's what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, I I can't, I didn't always do this. I mean, this to me takes layers and layers of work to be able to kind of innately do that without thinking, okay, that's the process I need to run to run through. Now it's so innate and it's so second nature that, you know, the moment I feel something that's anxiety or anger, I immediately know that's, that's me, or at least to look at me first and walk through that. And it's honestly a really amazing place to be because not only do I get to reconcile kind of negative feelings towards other people, but I get to reconcile a lot of negative feelings about myself. And so I'm killing two birds with one stone, which is awesome. Yeah, I think that's a huge wisdom piece for our listeners and for myself to just really take in so valuable to when these emotions come up that are not, um, that's the word I want to use. Just not in alignment with like the people who we want to become and who we want to model ourselves after, that those emotions are just a signification to look deeper within. And and for me, I really do it as a way of like, and bring more love to those places that, that are feeling that way. Um, but I think that's so valuable what you brought forward about just like using that as a signal to say, hey, what's going on inside you? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So what have you had to give up in order to get what you want? Ego. I've had to give up ego. And um, that is harder to let go than you think it would be. Uh, Ego is often tied to that big thinking vision, uh, that big picture that you sometimes build for yourself. You have to be very careful about what goes on there, more so careful about the intention of why that thing goes on that list of whatever that big vision is. Um, but that was probably the reason that held me up in year three for so long was because I was so attached to the ego side of it. And when I think people think of ego, they think of this kind of extreme version of arrogance or, um, I don't know, authoritativeness or something. I think people think extreme. And so I think a lot of people tend to go, well, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself arrogant, which I never did. Um, and I don't consider myself, you know, um, a braggart, but there still are, and there still was some things in me that were very ego driven. So they don't even necessarily need to manifest publicly, which is important for people to know, because I know, know that I walked around for a long time thinking, oh, I don't have an ego problem. And I definitely did, you know, and so you have to be, it really boils down to the intentions of, of what you want in your life and why you're doing things. And it requires a really close examination of, you know, again, the why and asking why for everything in your life. And so uh, that was really hard for me to give up just because that was pretty much a lifelong habit that I had developed. So like any tough habit that you need to ditch, it takes a huge transition and change. For sure. Well, I really want to just acknowledge you because I feel like all the little things that were challenging that you've had to meet and probably continue to still meet, but all these things is like you created the perfect platform. Uh, Independence, it's like Best Kept Self is all about like the contributors and like you kind of having to step out of that. It's like what medicine that you've created for your own soul to be able to move through these things. So good for you. I do. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't even think about it that way, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> Just why it feels, it feels so different than a lot of other stuff that I've done professionally, and I've never been able to pinpoint that. But that actually gives me a good a good answer to that. So thank you. I appreciate that. So tell us about the reboot program. So um, what I discovered through coaching hundreds of entrepreneurs through the business, not the first two years maybe not even the first, the third year, but once they get to the end of the third year and beyond, uh, there's something that happens, I believe, in the majority of business owners that I've seen. And this isn't just what I've seen, this is also what's studied by the Small Business Administration, other people, but you see success rates start to drop with businesses around year five. And when you look at the success rates of businesses, the number 
number one cause for a business to fail is poor management. And I'm a minimalist at heart, so we already know this. Um, I always know that doing more means doing less. And for me, when I rebooted essentially in year three, that's what it required was stripping down, removing ego, getting back to the core focus of what I'm really good at, what I'm talented at, and evolving with it. And unfortunately, the message that's being told to business owners when they get into these years of their business is that they need more, whether it's a business school or, or a, a webinar and Facebook ads, or they need to go get another certification, or they need to change a business model, they need to launch more services. And they're already at this place, potentially, where they're burnt out. Overwhelm has just become a permanent lifestyle for them. Their personal life has taken a backseat. Their self-care is absolutely low on the priority list. And so I feel very passionate that the solution is not more, not only again from what I've seen, but what now that we know that management and the way you run your business is most likely the number one reason that it's failing, it's about how you work and it's about working smarter. And so the reboot program kind of takes a minimalistic approach, walking you through these four phases of getting you through those crucial stages of the business that could literally make or break, whether you end up on the side of success or the side of failure. Um, when you look at those rates and it's completely all about measuring first taking a recon of everything that you're doing and tracking your time it then walks you through a phase of stripping things down editing streamlining delegating learning how to accept we then move into a reinforcement stage of reinforcing new habits that are productive and efficient and building a lifestyle around your business so it incorporates your personal life and then we wrap this all up with the fourth the stage of developing a worthy mind. And by the end of these eight weeks, you are a new mindset about how you run your business and what's important to you. And it, again, is kind of, you know, everything that I went through, but it's um, also proven through the other entrepreneurs that I've worked, worked with this through kind of casually, who have felt this immense amount of pressure that they need to do more or hustle more. And they have no time to do that at this point. So it's, kind of a relief to know that your answer is actually in doing less and your answer is actually simplifying and getting down to a place where you can just provide outstanding work so you can eliminate up to 80% of your energy time and your money drains. Um, so that's what Reboot is all about. And like I said, it's been a year concretely in the works, but this has been years, you know, since I went through it in terms of putting this into a method. And it's been super exciting and it's, it's really... I had to speak on it today at a conference and I just, I love it so much and I'm so excited to introduce it to the world. Well, I'm so glad that you created it and I can't wait to get my toes in it a bit more. Um, I, I think it's so valuable what you're offering to, to people and to entrepreneurs and for myself, I'm not at that stage three or five year in my business, but at year one, I had all these ideas about creating all these things. And it was like, I have so much inspiration and so much content that is constantly running through me that it was like, I always wanted to create something new, 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 new. And yeah. my business coach was like, let's just take, what if we try this? And he just totally presented me with this simplified, simplified plan, like a plan for the year. And it, it's something that I can just redo every year. These three programs, super simple that like this part of the year, this thing in this part of the year and this thing at this part of the year. And, and then my private clients in between. And it just was like, I left feeling a hundred pounds lighter and yeah. it totally changed my world, my perspective. I soon after like hired assistance to to just take some of the work off and my whole business has thrived so much since I just simplified everything and that simplification has changed how I feel in my personal life it's changed how I want to grow my business in a smart way and it's changed like the amount of time that I have for self-care and just balancing and it's mm -hmm. been a huge shift so I love that that's what you're bringing forward 
Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because more people need to hear that message. There's enough pressure as is between the simple scrolling of your Facebook feed to be farther, to be faster, to be whatever that um, to hear that someone, you know, has the success. Like to me, we need to start seeing the praises of simplicity, getting back to a minimalistic approach, getting back to doing less and doing less at a much higher quality level. Um, because so many things can be resolved if we focus our time and energy on simply providing an amazing, outstanding service to our clients, but we have trade-offs when we have a million other things to manage, mm -hmm. and the trade-offs are usually And so if you're busy doing all the social media and all of the um, graphics and all the website and, and all these collaborations, then your actual bottom line service, your client work is going to suffer. And so it's just getting back to um, providing an outstanding service because the difference between providing a good service and an outstanding service is an outstanding service will sell itself and you don't have to do all those other things. So it's a rather simple message, much harder to implement, of course. Yeah. And I, I'm, when I work with my clients, it's like, there's so many ideas. They're often like very new green entrepreneurs just starting something. I really like to facilitate the like birthing process and the conception of what people are doing. And once it's kind of going, I, I'm not as involved and I, that's my preference and everyone kind of has strengths in different areas, but it's always like start with a little and yes. like master that. And I think for so many people, it's like in the beginning because of finances you have to learn how to do everything. You have to learn how to do graphics and web and just like on the basic level. And it's so valuable to know how to do all that stuff. And then once you are doing all of it, you're like, Oh, I actually love this part of my business. And I didn't, I wouldn't have known that. And just doing what you love and outsourcing what's not your highest excitement creates so much space for you to do more of what you love. And you just feel better about that. And your business will thrive because you feel better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, I think that we also put a lot of pressure on ourselves that we need to give up the minutia. Like if we're going to be successful, I feel like all that's talked about is um, outsource your graphic design, outsource your social media, outsource your whatever, you know, and, and stick to the client work. I want to be careful that I'm not, that that's not what you are hearing because you're right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I do that people would be like, you do the website. And I'm like, yeah, I do the website, but because I love to do the website. Right. And I can easily, should I, should I be doing it? I don't know. That's up to me to determine. But if I'm going to do the website, I have to be aware that I'm going to be making other trade-offs. So I have to be very careful if this is what I love and I want to keep this on my plate and there's an easy delegation strategy for me to push it off, then I need to be aware that I'm going to have to give up other things over here. So it's really all about assessing your trade-offs and making the right calls. And if I get tired of doing the website, I outsource it, you know? So it's, um, I don't think there's a, there's a specific formula for everyone. The formula is pinpoint the things that when you're done doing them, you feel fulfilled and keep those. And when you're done doing things that you feel relieved and you're happy they're over, those are the things that need to be edited, streamlined, or delegated. That's a simple sign to separate that list and go from there to clean it up. Yeah. That's, that's what I was hearing. And like, for me, I have a background in graphic design and creative direction. So like the website, the like tech aspect of the website, like the coding and all that stuff. I don't, I don't do that, but the graphic design and all of that for, for social media, it's just like, for me, it's really fun. So I really like to do it. And I'm so specific on like, image and branding and like what's being put out there with my name on it that if I was to outsource that and let somebody else do it like I just would always have these little things like uh oh, if I did it it would have just <laughs> so yeah. for me I know that's like part of my highest excitement so I I love to do that and I do it and there's parts that I'm like I don't want to do this and I exactly. ask somebody else exactly so can you give, can you share with us like a piece of wisdom that somebody has given you that you heard it and you were just like, oh my God, it just changed your world. Let's see. I think um, the one that always sticks with me is actually that um, 
that Einstein quote about, you know, you can't solve your problems with the, with the way that they, in the way that they were created. And I'm not, I'm not saying it right, but um, if you're going to solve your problem, you can't, you can't use it in the same mindset that you got into that problem. Um, have you heard that before? You might know the quote more succinctly than I. And I'm not sure of the quote, but I've heard something about like the definition of insanity is like doing the same thing again and again and expecting di different results. And I don't think yeah. that's the quote that you're thinking of, but it's, yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not that one, but it's essentially, you know, when, a lot of times when we're solving our own, when we're solving our own problems, we're doing it with the same mindset that got us into that problem. And this was told to me by the life coach that I've worked with over the past few years. And it just, it, it clicked one day that, you know, so many of the issues that I, of course, we're still in this kind of what I call 1.0 mindset. And that's the, that Shauna 1.0 mindset is the reason I got into this problem. So I had to create first before I could solve it, a different mindset. And that kind of was a signal to me that there were so many other steps that needed to happen before that. And all I was trying to do this whole time was what I call solve the surface. And you can't just solve the surface. Oftentimes you can't just throw a bandaid over something or whatever. There's a, there's a mindset shift that has to happen before that. And so when I'm feeling like I can't overcome a problem or an issue, I look to see if I haven't yet developed the right mindset to even solve it in the first place. And a lot of times that's the case. And then I need to go back and then assess and figure out and go deep with, okay, then what's the mindset that I need to have? Because right now I'm in the same mindset that got myself into this problem and I can't do the same getting out of it I really like that there's um makes me think of like an arborist uh if there's an issue with a tree it's you can see in the leaves that there's something not right with it but usually you have to go down into the root system to fix the problem you have to like bring nutrients or vitamins down deeper um, because it's not just the base level of of soil it's like usually this like deeper issue so um, I think that's really good. And I just love the way you put it with like Shauna 1.0, like Luna 1.0, Luna 2.0, you have to evolve and step up in order to, and I think that that's what those, like a problem, a challenge is inviting us to do. It's inviting us to step up into the next version of ourselves in order to grow. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's like a problem is an opportunity um, to step into 2.0 or 3.0. And I love that. I'm totally going to remember that. Yes. So I want to wrap up. And one of the things that we do at the end is share one to three women who have given you a permission slip, who have embodied something that, have, that has allowed you to step up into your greatest self. So one to three women who have inspired you in that way. Uh, the first one would be my mom. That's probably cheesy, but totally my mom. She was one of those is, I shouldn't say why she is one of those women that, um, you know, constant supporter and was very good at directing me without directing me. She gave me so much direction without controlling it, but gave me hints at the right time throughout my life. And, and was very good about pointing out what I was talented at, or if she noticed something that I really enjoyed doing and was good at, she would let me know that maybe you could pursue that, you know, just kind of pushing me ever so slightly in the right direction as she saw things. And then she would let me discover it. And she also was one of those women that when I was growing up, I never once heard her look in the mirror and say, anything about herself negatively, not once, which I didn't realize how amazing that was until I was in my mid twenties. Like, wow, to have a mom that never talked down about herself. And, and I discussed this with her and she said, well, that's not how I felt internally, which I'm sure she didn't because we all have our own insecurities, but to be able to refrain from doing that in front of me as her daughter had such an immense, profound effect on my confidence levels growing up that it is totally a new soapbox of mine. Um, and I'm not a mom yet, but if I have a daughter or a son or, you know, either, I am going to take that same lesson that she didn't know she was, she was doing and hope that my children never see me talking negatively about myself in front of them. Um, I don't think I would have ended up the same way if that dynamic was at play. So I just think that that's truly one of the best gifts that she inadvertently was giving me. Wow. What a gift. Um, so she's What's her name? Yeah. A huge gift. Um, 
Gosh, I know. What's your mom's name? I hate name? to say this. It's Joanne. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Thank you, Joanne. Um, and I hate to say that, I mean, I can't think of another another one off the top of my head that's like top of mind, that's strong. But that's not to say, I mean, I work with women constantly and I feel like I get a gift from every single interaction. And so that's why I'm having a hard time thinking of one that's so amazing because, I mean, even just today, I got a client video in response to the course that I run for my studio and it was so touching. I was just you know, in tears at my desk. She just was so thankful. And she has no idea the gift that she's given me as her teacher. And so um, and there's just so much, like there's so much abundance in that, in that life for me. So I'll, I'll save that slot exclusively for Joanne. Beautiful. Well, Joanne surely deserves it. And she's created a, an amazing woman who we're so blessed to have here. And you just do so much for for your peers and inspiring people and supporting so many people, especially women stepping up into their greatest selves. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. <laughs> and is there anything that you want to share with our audience that you have coming up or places where they might be interested in learning more about what you're offering? I mean, the obvious place is bestkeptself.com. Um, just head over there a gold mine of stuff in every capacity mind your looks your health your fitness and uh, startrebooting.com is the website for the reboot program we'll be launching later this summer the next round of the course itself and again it's eight weeks long so if you're interested in that you can hop over there and get on the wait list cool awesome that's so great i'm looking forward to to diving deeper into that myself um so thank you so much for being here today. I feel like you shared so many gems uh, with myself and our audience. And it's just really lovely to, to have you and to receive that, the wisdom from your beautiful experiences and, and challenges as well. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all the listeners for being here and listening and sharing. Um, we will see you next time. Bye for now, everyone. It's freebie time. We love you so much and we couldn't do this without you. And we know that you're passionate about everything that we're discussing here. So we've created not one, but two free giveaways for you. One is the amazing in-depth interactive ebook exploring the seven pillars of feminine leadership. And the second is a guided meditation for you to align to your heart's knowing. Head on over to ladieswholeadpodcast.com to sign up and instantly get both of those amazing goodies. Thank you all so much for being here. What a gift to share in such beautiful communion with these wise ladies who lead. As you know, the likes, the stars, clicks, comments, reviews, and shares are so gratefully welcomed as it helps spread the word and inspire to lead from within. Thank you. To hear more of our other guest interviews and to learn more about this movement, head on over to ladieswholeadpodcast.com where you can subscribe to never miss an episode. I'm so grateful we spent this time together. Until our next one, let your heart